Welcome to The Truth in This Art. I am your host, Rob Lee. Today, I'm thrilled to be in conversation with my next guest, a Dominican-born independent curator, artist, and museum advocate. She graduated with an MFA in curatorial practice from the Maryland Institute College of Art, MICA, here in Baltimore, and a BFA in fine arts and media from Parsons, the new school. Please welcome Dulcina Breu. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, Rob. It's super, it's super good to have some time and talk to you and be surprised by your questions. <laughs> I'm so ready. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and thank you for, for making the time. And, you know, I think as, you know, I go through kind of changing how I approach the questions, that's, that's really important to, <laughs> you know, make it feel like conversational, make it feel more you know, and I'm always tweaking, right? So in going into it, one of the things I've been very, very interested in and the folks that I speak with is, you know, sort of the bedrock, sort of the the origin story around their creative endeavors and such. So, you know, could you share some of your earlier interests um, that may have like impacted like why you approach the work that you're doing today? And if you will, describe the work that you're doing today. For sure. Thank you so much, Rob. Yes, uh, my very beginning in the arts, um, I was blessed and all to have um, some members of my family that were approaching arts, culture and education in different ways. Uh, so my first approach, it was in through public and dancing and theater, uh, through El Teatro Popular Danzante, the popular dancing theater that my um, one of my aunts uh, my aunt Niledis was part of, uh, and it was with Nereida Rodriguez, who is an Afro dancer and choreographer and professor uh, who left us a very strong legacy to take on, a, a very important heritage. And my aunt uh, Miledis as well did a lot of work with Fradica Lizardo, who was the partner and creative partner of uh, Nereida Rodriguez, and she was her archivist. So she worked in the ballet. She worked with him, with Fradico Lizardo as archivist, and she was also working in the um, Casa de Teatro, who was a very uh, a spontaneous a space for poetry, um, music, art. Um, it, it kind of like started in Santo Domingo, Dominican Republic around the 80s. So I grew up kind of in this cocoon in between this reality with my aunt and um, a speleology with my other uncle. So it, it was very into uh, seeing the roots, seeing the roots uh, with my uncle Domingo uh, of the Tainos, of all the other like migrants that were in and out of the island before colonization. And then seeing how these fusions that happened after um, the land was taken by the colonizers, how these fusions were evolving into uh, Dominican identity uh, in in the sense of music rituals with my aunt. So I think like my process is very research based is quite rooted into uh, collaborations with communities. So mm -hmm. as an artist, I was very inspired by um, the materials that somehow I was seeing in my house. And yeah, I saw the Dominican uh, kind of like labor force very involved in, in New York when I moved. And so I'm very based on the cra Dominican craftsmanship, uh, a lot of like assembling line choreography. Uh, if you can, if I can explain a little bit the Please. assembling line, like painting the walls or like constructing um, a few dry walls, and and you have like these different steps to like actually craft uh, a whole a whole space, a whole yeah. mood. Uh, it can be office, it can be commercial, but it's building from the ground for others to live in. Mm. And um, my family members, um, my my mother and their seven um, brothers and sisters, yeah. <laughs> they're quite a big family. Uh, they all were part of 
putting together the house where they live, um, where I grew up. Yeah. Uh, and it was made of concrete, very strong concrete. I remember when I was like a teenager, I was not even able to like grasp a signal inside because my my grandfather like did it like a fort. Like this is the <laughs> space where we are going to like be protected. Yeah. It was built around like the revolution in 1965. So um, I think a lot of these elements of protection of uh, construction into uh, community-based choreography are mm. very um, evident in my work. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. So, so in it, there is so just kind of growing up and living in your family. <laughs> you know, it's just like <laughs> those are my earlier creative creative interests. I'm around it all the time. Around folks who yeah. are creative and have a background. So it's a, it's as if you're. In, in doing the work that you're doing, you're, you're doing sort of the next phase of that, that legacy, you know, is that, mm -hmm. is that fair? Yeah. Yeah. I think this is why I was gravitating towards history museum when I was like, as well, moving into curatorial and artistic practice. I really um, have an infatuation with history. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. So in, in talking about sort of your educational background and in, in that, talk about that a bit and like kind of like in that experience and you have Micah, we have Parsons. Talk about like how that kind of like, you know, directed you a little bit more, you know, to mm -hmm. what you wanted to do professionally. Yeah. Um, first of all, I did the National School of Fine Arts. It is a public <laughs> art school in the Dominican Republic, and that took a lot of time because education is politicized over there. So not a lot of like professors were there to like teach you and like also thinking that people wanted to like graduate from the school and be actual artists. Yeah. So that was a challenge for me. So after I graduated, like it was six years. Uh, for an associate, yeah. Um, I got a scholarship to go to a private school that is affiliated with Parsons, mm -hmm. that is called Altos de Chabon. And the first one was in Santo Domingo, the National School of Fine Arts in La Zona Colonial, uh, really involved like in the art artistic scene. But the second one, it was in Altos de Chabon y La Romana in Casa de Campo. And this one, it's a little bit more, um, kind of like looking into a global lens for design. Yeah. And uh, I was very attracted to design solutions um, mm. because it was isolated. It was in, on the top of a hill with a river under. So we were like very into, like very connected to nature. Sure. Um, over there, I think like colorism um it was very evident too because like you have a lot of like the people that like are owners of the spaces of like light skiing or european doesn't um kind of like um heritage yeah. and then everybody that is like in other roles are often their skiing so i saw different realities one how like we were like immersed in like this private education uh there is very focused on design and finding solutions and social solutions in it and then facing the realities of dominican republic of social disparity so i think this this particular school created um a lot of questioning about yeah. why i want and what i want to do with my artistic practice yeah. in this space of learning so when i came to parsons it, it was immediately that i really wanted to talk about the labor aspect um mm -hmm. seeing my my body racialized in in the particular migration from the dominican republic to new york and seeing that part of my family as well were labor laborers in construction and restaurant businesses, um, dishwasher, um, busing line, um, kind of like domestics. So yeah. I, I saw that kind of like questioning that started in Altos de Chabon, passing over into what I wanted to communicate in Parsons. Parsons, it was a little bit more like research based projects, in sure. which I focused on Dominican labor and craftsmanship in New York and Micah later on was more about how to 
expand um, this scope of my artistic practice within a curatorial lens um, and how to integrate and create spaces to continue talking about these histories, honoring these histories, but at the same time, passing over to people that maybe have never heard about the journey yeah. of my community and uh, the legacies and how New York have been very shape up or at least like contemporary New York have been very shaped up by Dominican labor. No, oh, thank you. I, I think that that makes sense. It's kind of like having, you know, diving in, understanding some of the background, being able to do the research and the sort of archival component to an area of interest for you. And then yes. having mm -hmm. sort of the curatorial, like, all right, I want to do it through this lens to have the biggest impact and go from there. And that feels like, and I think because of maybe I've read it in your, your bio somewhere, but it feels like <laughs> it, it, it feels like mu museum activism, right? Like, you know, yeah. being a museum professional and being a, an activist, definitely, it you know, you're speaking to what's baked in within your work. So mm -hmm. what do you feel is the role of like an activist within that sort of museum space? Mm, I think like, first of all, like we need to like understand pretty clear who are we yeah. i entered to the museum space first of all in the dominican republic and it was really easy to navigate over there um and explain why it was important to talk about these particular topics even though i was working with with african and and afro-caribbean um collections in el hombre the Museo del Hombre Dominicano, who's hmm. like the kind of like the Museum of Anthropology and Culture, um, a national museum, so we have a national lens. Uh, but over here, it was a little bit more difficult to explain why or what was the scope of diversifying. Mm -hmm. And so when I came along, um, I explained pretty well that I'm a queer, Latina, femme, very Caribbean, so I was not that much assimilated into yeah. this like a white Latino spectrum, and I needed to like explain to them because sometimes they were quite just presenting the white Latino for the white gays, mm -hmm. and uh, I think I needed to like unpack a little bit what, how the dynamic was gonna take place, but it was gonna take in place. Um, First of all, uh, seeing what were the laws in which this content was going to live, <laughs> how much we are going to like, uh, how much agency we were going to give to the community members that were going to like give us their histories and yeah. how we are going to like protect them from all the hatred that we are seeing in America, um, that we have been seen since day one, but it's still like very present, uh, especially with government funded um, spaces that sometimes like other people believe that is only white America that has right. access or a say in how to shape and um, kind of like portray and narrate American history. So um, I entered this space, understanding that that was needed, I will do my job that is properly collect and diversify these sure. collections, not only with Latinos, but also queer Latinos, also queer uh, Afro-Latinos, also, <laughs> you yeah. know, people in different ages. So we will understand different perspectives. So, yeah, I think um, it took a minute for me to understand how much push did we need. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but at the same time, I feel like very happy that the results that I at least I see in right now in American history, uh, especially with the 9-11 uh, collection, which I was like very big part on expanding, um, we can we can narrate and we can give we can provide to educators, to researchers, many different voices that were not 
present in maybe like four years ago and see and understand how legislation have been shaping by yeah. the labor of so many Latinos, um, at least like to have um, health support um, for more than 70 years, I think like they got funding for the 9-11, um, the people affected by 9-11. Yeah. And, and that was like one of the roles that I was kind of like um, playing and at the same time exercising this museum advocacy. No, thank you. That's that's great. And I think hearing about sort of like being able to share and help amplify the stories of folks that, you know, previously were not part of that conversation. I think it's a disservice for folks not to be in there. And going back to one of the things you touched on about um, sort of in the museum world and some of the fine art spaces, folks that look like <laughs> you and I, there's mm -hmm. a, a certain way that they want our stories to be out there. And I think part of the message is lost when someone like you and I doesn't, you know, stand up and say, no, nah, I think we need to have something that's really representative and we got to do this right. You know, mm -hmm. we can't like just, hey, here's a few pictures of people that look brown and yeah, sure, they're queer, they're this, they're that, you okay. know, but it's like it has to feel real. Otherwise, you're mm -hmm. losing sort of the you're losing the story. You're losing the sort yeah. of narrative. You're not preserving culture in that way. And, mm -hmm. you know, you're just kind of just putting a, a different color over the same things that are being told. Yeah, um, there is something very important that maybe I mentioned, but I wanted to highlight. Please. Is that is the agency, how for me it was so important that whatever we, whatever interpretation we were giving to these pieces, it was a collaboration with the community and they were going to approve and and correct us like if we were making a mistake one of the biggest issues that we have right now in museums and it's that colonization literally like misinterpret everything because um before none of our communities have agency and saying this is not a ritualistic piece this is a guira yeah. you know this is an instrument this is not a tool for cutting cheese or you know like all these like different things that i know that like it, they are quite offensive but you cannot imagine like we have so many of them or like just the word on saying we're artifact maybe from africa you know like we ha we need to confront the fact that this massive theft <laughs> yeah. this uh massive robo as we call um it's very evident and it's very vivid because we are paying with our taxes uh, to to preserve these materials and we cannot even use it because we don't even know what we have. Right. And this problematic have been kind of like pushing us into in, instead of like a start instead of like continue collecting and this kind of like need of like um kind of like be full of ourselves saying that we are going to like acquire this is to actually show care yeah. for these other stories that are there like in this kind of cemetery of colonialism and have never been kind of like connected to the real root and for the museums to actually think how they are going to use it. Sometimes like people are like, oh, I don't know how to connect with this community. We want these, these visitors to come over, but they haven't even looked into their drawer and say, maybe we have some stories in here that okay. we can collaboratively bring into life. But still, I think like, this is why I took like maybe a few, like a year and a half of break from the museum <laughs> field because until like we don't have that mission. Yeah. Um, I I believe that we're going to like continue just like having these um apologies from the museum. Oh, it's a story we didn't know that yeah. we're going to like create more harm in the community. Yes. Like yeah. 
it's kind of <laughs> it's kind of that thing where I, I remember, and, and maybe this relates, maybe it doesn't, but I remember speaking with a guest who um, is a photographer, and you know, kind of documents like different things, documents Baltimore, what have you. As you know, mm-hmm. we were down here. Baltimore's very black. And I, <laughs> this, this photographer was was told by one of these folks that um, wants to document things and document things through a certain perspective. And they were, you know, okay. a white person. Can you take some of the blackness out of it? It's a very weird request from a photographer who is black that is covering a black city. And it's like, what is the motivation behind it? It's like, you know, are you, are you documenting the city? Or are you documenting a certain slice of the city? What is the story you want to tell? That's it, it leads to questions versus what are we doing here? And exactly. And, and I think it starts to because I've really been interested in this recently. Like, how do we keep culture? How do we keep stories and being able to move it ahead for somebody to have like, you know, more attention on it, more eyes on it, more, you know, sort of like access to it? And, you know, what are the roles that folks play in it? So from from your vantage point. And being an independent curator, like what is the role of a curator with with kind of moving culture along? Is it more of a steward role? Is it more of a protector role? What is the role of a curator from your perspective? Um, it depends of each curator. What is the role that they want to play? Because I have some friends that they are very happy to be the face of an institution and sure. be in the New York Times all the time playing the role that the museum wants and like reading the teleprompter, you know? It depends like what type of curator you want to be. You want to be an institutional curator that is cleaning the whole, all the situations for, you know, the institutions and trying to bring some money or like brings like certain communities without understanding how harmful like that can be or you want to be a mediator or you want to be a promoter because like they are different in my case I'm a mediator I like to be an independent creator that um, is brought to the table because of certain communities that I'm working with especially like queer latinx contemporary art uh, or queer Latinx community-based collecting. If somebody tells me, Dulcina, we are very looking into these communities. Like, do you have any idea? I will be super ready and I will make sure that, you know, both like the community and the institution are in a common ground. And it will never be in a common ground because there, there are certain hierarchies. The institution is always going to have like that. The big hand, but my role as a creator, the one that I wanted to create for myself is to be a mediator in between communities and institutions. Um, I know that for certain reasons, I was in the Smithsonian, so I was um, a consultant creator that had certain privilege because uh, not a lot of people like handle the budget and like, you know, kind of like being in a presence and nurtured by other creators and people in the field as this opportunity that I have. So I need to acknowledge that, but I believe that my role over there was uh, to work with the community that, I, that I'm that i from. Yeah. And when the project ended up, I just decided to be working independently and very happy to be back in New York. And uh, the project that I wanted to like work with, he was um, thankfully received an award from NYU. And I've been uh, working with the Latinx project who understood the urgency. Yeah. Uh, they had this type of roles, not only the content, but also having a spaces for independent curators to showcase their ideas and the way that they were reading uh, and giving another spaces for um, Latinx community or contemporary in the contemporary world. But yeah, I think like uh, it was uh, it was very important for me to find an outlet that will mm-hmm. nurture a curator that is very focused on mediation rather than an institution who is going to like want me to do black busters with latinx artists that everybody knows already uh 
I I believe that that's necessary because not a lot of people know. Mm -hmm. So I need to acknowledge that. Um, sure. There is a show that I actually, there are certain shows that I truly like was inspired. Um, there is one that I was um, very little time working with them, supporting them, but it was very meaningful uh, and has been paused right now. Mm. Uh, because um, some of right wing decided that <laughs> in the Smithsonian that this project it was very um maybe radical or but it was talking about the legacies of the young lords, uh, the Latino um chapter of the Black Panther Party that started yeah. in Chicago and started in New York as well, and they changed america they changed right. the way that we have patient bill of rights they changed the way that uh, a lot of um treatment for addiction uh was performed uh and they paused the show but that gave me this uh kind of push that even though this museum was going to pre present uh legacies that i already know there are a lot of people that don't know about the young really? lords and we still need to like be pushing, even when we think that certain blockbuster shows, <laughs> they don't need to exist, they they do. And I think like, this is why I wanted to be like very flexible in which like each person needs to decide what kind of role in terms of cultural practice they want to have. And yeah, mine is a mediator. <laughs> No, that's that's great, and I, I think we we always any any community needs someone that's pushing for that that's that's in the side that has the background within the arts community, having the arts education, having the the acumen to know like the ins and outs, and it's like all right, advocate, mediator, hey, this is an idea you're going to do right by us, right? And I think that's probably served you very well in being able to to work with different artists different sort of uh cultural preserva uh, preservationists and i would imagine maybe that perspective you know that approach has kind of helped in your your own creative work right because you're not yeah. just you know you're also an artist too you know i'm also an artist <laughs> <laughs> so talk, talk about your art a little bit for the folks uh yeah so I'm going to say maybe like the simple way. Uh, so I see movement as a drawing, as migration, as a line that is going to take different shapes and forms. So I decided to work with choreography that is influenced by um, assembling line and craftsmanship. Uh, in that sense, it's quite minimal. Sometimes I'm... Um, literally like painting a room that could be reminiscence of my imaginary nursery room mm -hmm. uh this one is like size 5w it was one of my favorite pieces so i was playing as the role of a dominican painter that is covering these residential spaces maybe in park avenue that can like if uh full maybe like three times the size of <laughs> uh of a nursery room for a baby and like carefully thinking about this whole world that they are going to create and i decided to create it for myself and uh, have a second chance of like providing for myself things that maybe because of precarity in the moment that I was born, I, I couldn't have. So I was just like enjoying talking to my mother and seeing what were her choices maybe if she had a second chance to bring, you know, a little Caribbean woman into the world um, as a single mother. So I think like these conversations as well are very per personal with family members uh, so I paint the whole room kind of like impersonating my my uncles that have been doing that and we didn't know that they were having such a big kind of like a strong labor or like physical labor uh, they often were sending money we didn't know you know uh, so I think that's another way to honor all the uh, efforts of them but they kind of like walk me through a uh, certain elements of the work i did uh, this one and then i started like peeling it and making myself part of the room uh and 
it ended up being a little bit like dramatic because the room ended up being kind of like this uh decom like deconstructed curtains that sometimes I saw it was it didn't happen in my family in my house but my other vecinos my neighbors like the way that they were dividing the room it was through this curtain so I think these like um elements of design that I've seen in from precarity uh speaks of um at how elements or how resilience have been portrayed mm. and and very vivid for dominican diaspora and like dominicans in the island as well so yeah right now i'm working in another piece uh called territorio and i'm very excited about that one um it's a um, kind of um uh, ceremony to go back and connect with people that i grew up with some some of them that were part of the ballet from the uh, teatro popular danzante the the public dancing theater yeah. and other friends uh, from my from my hood in the in santo domingo my hood villa maria is a carnavalero uh, hood like it's very uh interested in carnival they literally like have different economies that go around the carnival and uh, with the bodegas like sometimes like they are doing public rehearsals uh of the choreography so like the bodegas like give free um sometimes like beer for them and people are uh, go around and they gather to like see their rehearsals uh, they have the Diablo Cajuelos as well, that they are kind of like characters for the carnival. And there are a lot of people that are doing the costume. Some of my family members were part of like um, making the costume kind of like Taylor. Yeah. I did masks at some point. I did masks with some friends uh, that I have a very long uh, heritage of the Cole Los Dragones, the dragons of Villa Maria and it's like a comparsa, it's like a group of these characters. So each year they do a different concept. And sometimes when I was in um, in the National School of Fine Arts, I was doing the molds or the different elements and coming over to my friend's house. Uh, that is part of kind of like the song of one of the um, founders of the group. And we were like exploring with papier mache, exploring how to like change um so or integrate other materials and i there that was like very part very important part for me yeah. in this particular practice it, it was this craftsmanship as well and the sounds so territorio right now is kind of like a vocabulary of all these um elements uh of design and art kind of like the sound of the um Batum Ballet or like Alibaba that we have. Um, and I think it's interesting how some elements, when I was living in Baltimore, I was seeing these elements, especially with uh, with the bands, with the uh, Battle of Bands. Yeah, so yeah. we have Battle of Bands in my in, in Villa Maria. So yeah. I think integrating that as well um, gives me um, another avenue how to talk about my roots with friends in Baltimore and see that we were not that far apart. Yeah. Like we were far apart geographically, but in terms of the sounds, in terms of the movement, we were so close. And th this is the very beauty of kind of like Caribbean and African diaspora. I saw like Blue Caribbean <laughs> I went to Blue Caribbean uh, and went to other spaces that were integrating music from my country in Baltimore. So I wanted to like kind of like have a, a love letter from my hood and other neighborhoods that nurture me and make me feel home. It's called Territorio. <laughs> I, I, I love that. I, I love when those things come together and it, it is... Um... It makes it makes me feel even like it, one proud to know you. Two, uh, <laughs> like happy that that sort of introductory question that we you know way back when kind of yeah, you know, definitely connects. So that's that's really great. That's really great. And um, mm -hmm. 
I think I think what we can do now is because I think you kind of did the mic drop there a little bit. So I think it's time for us to kind of go into some of these rapid fire questions, if that's all right with you. Yeah, I'm super excited. <laughs> so I got a couple of them for you. Don't overthink mm-hmm. them. Don't overthink them. They're, they're, they're fun <laughs> questions. They're questions, though. Yes, already. All right. So here's here's the first one I got for you. Um, how many hours of sleep do you typically get? Three to four. Uh, we're going to need to get those numbers up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Acupuncture is, is, I went to, um, a play, like I went to, uh, on the, oh my God, I can tell you that later, but I went to performance space like last week and they yeah. were having an acupuncture and electronic, yeah. uh, performance by, uh, Gio Escobar and it worked that day. I slept eight hours. Okay. Okay. I, li- I like hearing that. I like hearing that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what is because you're you because you're a fashion person, I can see it with the glasses. No one else can see it. I can see it with the glasses, <laughs> I can see it with the fit. Um it, what would be one word you would use to describe your fashion sense? Mm. Can I put two words together? Please. Rancho Dyke. <laughs> great. <For sure. laughs> great. That's so funny. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's my favorite style. Great. Uh, what is your favorite color combination? Uh, uh, lemon green and pink. In in uh, Benjamin Moore language, it's called anime. <laughs> and the pink is the bubble gum. <laughs> Is, I'm a big like Benjamin Moore. Such a, it's such a Caribbean combination, by the way. It's just like, how can it be brighter? Like, can I make the walls this color? <laughs> I love it. There is like, a, it, I think like our, after our first uh, conversation, yeah. I was looking around in my house and it was always anime and bubblegum. So <laughs> I love guess it. I have something with it. <laughs> yeah. Um. Name one artist that made you like fall in love with art, like to the degree where you're like, I know I'm going to invest a lot of my time, a lot of my energy, a lot of the blood, sweat, tears, all of those things into art, creativity, museum work, advocacy. Just name a person that's kind of like helped like guide you in that direction based on their work. I will need to be for <laughs> 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 it's impossible it's impossible the first one Sherezade Garcia definitely it was a big inspiration to me um, um, she ended up being my mentor in New York but I grew up with one little like cut out in my room since I was I don't know nine year old or yeah still she is a very big pink bubble gun and anime it has some turquoise so i love it uh but but she's a strong multidisciplinary artist and i respect her the most the second is elia alba um it, she has been working with with um photography and sculpture her collection of busts that she presented in bienal de la habana still i work with her as well i end up like being her assistant in here i cannot complain my life has been amazing people that i i kind of like seeing the books and say wow this is amazing this inspired me in some ways on how their god he always put them in my in, <laughs> in my way uh the other person is nicolas dumit estevez just like big creator and artist as well and he did the Papa Mobile, the the potato or like Pope Mobile, which he was a very um, kind of like game changer in performance art in the Dominican Republic and like worldwide as well. It was during the fifth never the fifth centenary of Columbus mm-hmm. uh, discovery. The <laughs> and then I mean, like the inverted like, the Americas. <laughs> so he literally did a procession with motoconchos, and he did like a whole situation, very comic, of being like the Pope, but yeah. it was a 
potato and he did a procession into the places that the Pope was never going to go uh, with a radio in front of his bicicleta, his yeah. bike uh, playing Ave Maria. And he was going to like neighborhoods like in the north side of the island. And everybody was in ecstasy. Uh, <laughs> and I think like if, if this is not the power of art to like create a commentary and at the same time like just like change the way that people like are having their daily life routine it definitely created an impact on me so yeah you had three <laughs> well thank you you you're, you're an overachiever i appreciate that i love it ah! <laughs> <laughs> so so with that um i think i think we wrap here um i want to i want to thank you for coming on to the podcast um <laughs> And I want to invite um, you to tell the fine folks where they can check you out, um, your social media, website, all of that good stuff. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, my dear. So, yeah, I'm Dulcina Abreu. My Instagram uh, goes by my name altogether. And I have a very special um, overview of Estilazo, my latest show. And it's inside the Latinx project on website under Estilazo and we are going to have a second iteration of it soon in Baltimore on uh, yeah. fall so I'm going to like keep you all posted uh, if you follow me in Instagram you can see when our dates coming which artists are going to like be present in the second iteration and know more about my practice and how's territorio coming along so thank you so much Rob <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, this was great. This was great. I, I'm, I'm just I'm just happy about this. So and there you have it, folks. I want to again thank Dosina Brayu for coming on to the podcast. Definitely look her up, look into her work. And I'm Rob Lee saying there's art, culture, community in and around your neck of the woods. You just got to look for it.